For those who don't know me or just been introduced to me, it's Johnny Bunting Jr. Y'all been calling me Johnny Force because Force was my street name. Now I want to show you that I didn't just come out of the woodwork and start talking about the situation with Choke and been bragging about having committed a homicide. So I'm going to show you what I've been doing for years now so that you won't think that I'm bragging about something. Show you. Brought up saying I didn't have no remorse and things of that nature. I'm gonna give you um, a piece of an interview and I'm gonna show you how long ago it was so you know that I didn't just put something together now just to say, yo, hey, I'm trying to do this for the youth. Here we go, enough talking. See? Interview with Johnny Bunting Jr. What prison did to me a year ago. Just a jewel with our host, Arthur Malik. Welcome to Just a Jewel. I'm your host, Arthur Malik. Today, we have a brother back who did 25 years of incarceration. We had him on my show once, and you can find him on my YouTube page, Just a Jew with Arthur Malik. This man is tackling all hurdles. He's come back because he's accomplished another goal, and I'm going to ask him to speak about that particular goal. Mr. Johnny Button Jr. Um, thank you for having me here once again. Absolutely, bro. Um, basically... I bought a car wash in the community, and I have been hiring folks of color. I've been hiring kids 15, 16, 17 years old, and I've been speaking to people in the community about supporting because a lot of people talk about supporting their own. They talk, and but they don't know what to do. So it's not like they have any malicious intent. But they say, I'm going to support, I'm going to support, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. But they don't know what to do. So I tell them, listen, if you want to support, well, if you, I'm paying these people. So if you come and you come to my establishment, you're helping to pay these same people that you don't want on the street. These kids uh, be into selling drugs, gang banging, scamming, all sorts of things that can get them in jail. And I know what the back, the bottom of that looks like the back of a cell, the bottom of the pit. I've been there. <laughs> right. And I'm saying, if I experienced this, and this is the age, 15 is where I started my stray. And so if I can catch them at them same ages, then I can be able to show them, listen, there's a better way. All that stuff you see about these guys with this little bit of jewelry and these cars and all this, they're headed down the wrong path. I've been there, I've done that, and I can see it coming. So if I can just put you a little bit onto the right path and show you, you can get some money doing it the right way, maybe I can catch a couple of them before it's too late. Now, it's, it's important that, uh, because it's imperative that we support each other. And as you just illustrated, they're not just supporting your car wash, but they're supporting the actual infrastructure of our society, and this is the children. Now, first and foremost, I would like to know, where is your car wash? Where is it located? What's the name of it? So these listeners or the people who are viewing the show can actually try to support it if they have that in their heart to do so. Okay, the name of it is Platinum Hand Car Wash. It's located in Mount Vernon on 40 West Lincoln Avenue. It's... It's been there. I didn't change the name. My company just bought that company and left it the same. So it already had clientele, but I had I put flyers all over Mount Vernon. Like mm -hmm. I was like I was running for the mayor or something. Right. And people been seeing the flyers and coming in. And I'm a pretty decent guy to talk to. So as I'm speaking to them, I'm telling them, listen, a lot of the owners that the previous owners been separate from the common people that's coming there. So they didn't know them. Like, you come there, you see me, I'll be washing the car, I'll be vacuuming, I'll be doing, like some people say, well, you work here? Like, yeah, I work here. Because right. I do. It's, you know, I just so happen to own it also, but 
I work here. And by me speaking to the people, it makes them feel a sense of a connection. Absolutely. You want to feel like you cool with that person. And it's like, well, if you and I are friends, it's more of a reason for me to come to your establishment. And if I have any complaints, then I can talk to my friend. Right. Because everything isn't perfect. The fact that I'm hiring some of these young kids it lets you know it's not going to be perfect because they need to be trained. So they're going to make mistakes. I've had one kid, he made a mistake and um, blemished the windows, puts, and the guy was irate. And I was talking to him, like, same way I'm talking to you right now. Right. He was yelling and cursing and all that, but I stayed the same even tone. And then he finally, like, I said, listen, there's nothing that we can't fix. Like, mm -hmm. it's just going to take a little bit of time. I'm hiring these kids. They make some mistakes. I said, would you have him on the street? Sell drugs? Would you have him on the street trying to rob you? Like, he made a mistake. He can make a mistake on the street, which can cost somebody their life. Exactly. He just cost you a little bit of dirty windows that we took 20 minutes to clean. Like, okay, light goes on, your windows are clean. And then he came back the next, the next week laughing about it because it wasn't nothing that couldn't be repaired. And nothing and, that you couldn't talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. But what, what, what I found or find amazing is, and I admire this aspect, is because you're teaching the youth the distinction between a boss and a leader. Because all on Facebook, when I see young people post things, they say, boss, I want to be a boss, I want to be a boss. And you're showing them the difference in your demeanor in being a leader opposed to being a boss. Because a boss simply tells someone what to do. A leader shows them how to do it. And you're participating in something you own when you can simply sit back and become just a boss. But you're teaching them the difference of a leadership. And you're right. And I thought about that when I first purchased it because guys were saying, like, yo, you shouldn't have to work. Like, some of the workers, like, you shouldn't have to work here, the boss. And I'm like, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't want, I want a camaraderie between me and my employees. Right. And the only way to get it is for me to be there. Like, you're in there in the trenches. I can make a mistake just like you. I'm not a fallible. Like, just because I own the place doesn't mean I'm perfect. Mm -hmm. And I want the people coming in, the customers, the clients, to be able to say, listen, I, like, people came and asked for me to do their car. Like, right. I want him. And because of the the care that I took in, the detail I, like, I'll inspect the car before I do anything, like, mm -hmm. and one person said, I've never seen nobody, like, pay this much attention to my car, and because that's what I do to my own. Right, right. Before, before I was uh, owning the car wash, I washed my car, my wife's car, and I would go look at it, like, you want to see the, the rough spots, like, a car is not, dirt isn't distributed evenly amongst the car, like, some, sometimes there's certain spots or depending on where you've been you may have stuff splashed on you or sometimes people park too close to a construction site all types of things can happen and so I look at it see where uh, where's my problematic spots like oh there's a blemish here this this that a third and we do detailing too mm. so you're looking for scratches right. and things that need special attention inside you're looking for stains it's not just I'm looking for dirt dirt is easy the stains, the blemishes, the scratches, those are the things that take more time to rectify. So your transitioning is amazing in respects to you exemplifying the term you're treating others how you wish to be treated because you said this is how you treated your car prior to having a car wash. And I say transition because you're definitely exemplifying the transition because I'm pretty sure prior to doing your 25 years of incarceration, you didn't think, you didn't have those particular thoughts and treating people how you wanted to be treated. So this is just an indication of how you're transcending in society, and it's amazing. It's, it's true because I didn't treat people too well. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and lie, but I wanted to be treated good. Absolutely. So it was a selfish state of mind. Mm -hmm. Now I look at it more selfless, where a lot of times I treat people the way I want to be treated, but I don't expect to be treated from them the way I treat them. Mm -hmm. It's just the way life is and oftentimes just like I said with the guy yelling and me keeping even tone mm -hmm. he had to think about it a lot of times we react and we do things mm -hmm. by 
myself included. I've just got better at it. Right. And we don't think. And sometimes a situation can occur when you don't think. Mm-hmm. And who knows how it may end up. But if I can, like, I literally have had time to, like, put scenarios together in my head. And all the scenarios don't play out to be exact. But it, it basically gives me, like, the guy or the girl who is enraged and what would I do as far as to calm them down? Like, we had the AVP and the ART and right, those right. things. We did skits. <laughs> right. So I remember those. Mm-hmm. And I didn't just do that to have the, the completion, the certificate. Well, not just in theory. You did it for practical reasons. Right. And I felt that it would help better me. Right. And it actually helped me to, like, rehuman, make myself humane again because I was dehumanized. And by me going through those things with an actual goal, like, listen, if I'm in a situation and this person is yelling this, that, and the third, and they act like they want to swing at me, what do I do? And so by putting myself in this frame of mind, training sessions in my brain, Mm -hmm. when these things occur, it gives me like, okay, I've been through this before, like mentally. Now, these are the steps that I'm going to take to defuse the situation. And this teaches others that's with me what to do because afterwards like yo that guy was yelling at you if it was me I would have did this Mm -hmm. well now you see that what I did and everything turned out right so if it's you you should mimic what I did because what you're saying you would have done you might have been in jail a lot of times though our expectations is what we really draw into fruition and I'm listening to you said that uh, you treat people how you want to be treated but you don't expect them to reciprocate that and I think if we do sometimes expect it, it may change an individual. Just not your demeanor, but the expectation itself sometimes you, we should give people so that may change their demeanor in accordance to the nice demeanor that you now have. Because once upon a time, people may have seen you walking down the street or seen me walking down the street and didn't expect a proper demeanor, didn't expect respect. Right. You see, So I think that we have to raise the bar a little bit when it comes to expectations from individuals who are where we once were. You're correct. Um, But what I realize is that sometimes there's a term that people say, I didn't make it up, killing the kindness. (laughs) Right. And I notice that sometimes a person can be, like, miserable. And if you say good morning to them, like, you could see the same person and say, good morning. So I've done this. When I was a kid, there was this guy. He was miserable. And we used to go to this building with these females at, and we used to go hang out with them. And he used to come and, like, run the guys off. Uh-huh. He wasn't related to none of the females, but that's what he'd do. And he'd come out, and I'd always say, good afternoon. I'd, I'd greet him. Right. He didn't say nothing to me. I see him every day. I say something to him. I say something to him. I say something to him. Now, he used to run everybody off. And it's not like he really talked to me or nothing because he never did that. Mm -hmm. But he would come, he'd see me, he would tell me to leave. He used to tell me to leave. So I was, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Then it got to the point, he'd look out the door, he'd see me, close the door. He'd come look out the door, see somebody else, yo, you got to go. So even though... I never had that conversation with him. He accepted me. Like, okay, that's the guy. The, the guy that's respectful. I'm not going to run him off. So that that's the best I could get from him. See, but, but that, I got so. that was great though because uh-huh. you know what most people do, and, and and miserable people, they still look for consistency. See, if you would have said good morning, good morning, two days in a row, he still would have sh- shoot you out. Get right. out of here. You can't stand. But he's seen that you were consistent. See, and when you see consistency, they are whatever that consistency shows. Right. You see, and he embraced that. He didn't have to have a, a long dialogue with you. You see, yes, he but, wasn't having it. <laughs> but, 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 but believe it or not, that was his way of saying that you're okay with me. Right. 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 So, you know, so he embraced it. He's seen your demeanor. And at, at that young age, he's seen it and he embraced it and it, and it penetrated. Trust me, it penetrated his heart. And there are guys, because. I noticed it, and I lived it. You have people who have proper home training. Mm-hmm. You get them around the house, they got manners, they're respectable, 
their clothes is off. Everything is good. Right. And then when they leave the house, that's when they pull the pants down. They get back Change into that they, robe. Yeah, yeah, turn, put their tight dress on. And right. Do, oh, yeah. I've done that. Mm -hmm. So I know that a lot of these kids, they still have the goodness in a, they're playing a role. So when they're around me, I, bring, I try to bring it out of them. Today, before I came here, earlier today, this brother came up to me, him and his son. And he said, I can't quote him directly, mm -hmm. but he said he had the Black Westchester in his hand because they had an article in there about me. He walked up, he's like, um, this is my son. He's up from North Carolina, somewhere mm -hmm. down south. And I'm trying to keep him out of trouble. I saw the article on you. I saw the, um, I was on the news a couple of days ago. Channel 12, I saw yeah. the Channel 12 news. So okay. he said, I need help. He said, I could have, I could have phrased it better, but I said, you phrased it just right. It was real, he cut to the chase. Mm -hmm. um, he needs someone to basically steer his child in the right direction, mm -hmm. show him about work, and to talk to him, like dialogue with him. And so I pulled him to the side and was like, listen, like there isn't no, you don't need a script. There's no script that you can come to me with. Mm -hmm. I don't need a script. Listen, tell me your truth. Mm -hmm. I was like, you heard about my truth and I told him about the YouTube with you and I before. I was like, look at that because that tells you a little bit more about my story. And I've been through stuff and I pulled the kid to the side and said, listen, I understand what it is to be ignored and it's that you're at that age where a lot of things you're trying to do, no one understands you. I said, you can pull me to the side and talk to me. Now, on the business side, this is what we're doing. We're gonna show you how to do this, that, and the third. And after I tell you something, if anybody tells you anything different, they're wrong. <laughs> Let me ask you, do you think that it is the youth fault because they are straight or do you think it's the parents' fault because the youth is astray? Or do you blame anyone? Um, place and blame is not right. And the reason why I say that is because every individual is different. Different set of circumstances, different set of facts, different set of factors. And like my, when I went astray, I don't blame my parents. My mother died. My father, I wasn't living with my father, but he was providing for me. I was living with my grandmother who was working a lot. And I was an honest student. I made that choice. I knew right from wrong. Now, if you have a child that isn't competent, meaning at that age where they don't know no better and they do something, still nobody's fault, but the child is something I don't know about supervision whatever but the age when you get to that age 13 14 15 where you know right from wrong uh, you know what selling drugs is you know what scamming is you know what robbery is but if you've been trained to do so let's say you you reach the age of a teenage now you're 13 and 14 and you've been trained to do so from the age of eight Oh, then there's some blame. <laughs> there's some blame. The trainer right. is wrong. But still, when you reach that age, it's, it comes to a point where you're cognizant of what's right and wrong. Even if you've been trained to do wrong, you still know it's wrong. You understand what I'm saying? You know what's amazing? Uh, I disagree somewhat because until I did prison time, until I was in prison doing time, all the negativity that I did, I thought was right. Sincerely, I thought was right. Because the kind of dissonance we justify our wrongs with cognitive dissonance. We justify if I if I if I shot a drug dealer, he was a drug dealer, he was hurting people. So my cognitive dissonance allowed me to justify that because he was a drug dealer. Right. But he still was a human being, so I didn't have the right to shoot him just because he was a drug dealer. Or uh, she was a prostitute, so I raped her because only she was a prostitute anyway. So I raped her. There's nothing wrong with that. She was selling her body and giving it away for free. 
So we justify our behaviors, and sometimes we actually think that our wrongs are right because we've been doing it so long. And I understand where you're coming from, and I've actually lived that because mm -hmm. I've sold drugs. Mm -hmm. I've hurt people, beat people up. I've right. done that, and I justified it with things similar to that. They're from this area. They're from here. Mm -hmm. I'm from here. We're supposed to be doing this, that, and the third. And you know what's like an eye-opener? An eye-opener is when something happens to someone that you care about, and then you hear that same reasoning, and you're not trying to hear it. You don't accept it. Right. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, okay, well, if this is your girlfriend, and the guy that got beef with you shoots her, she's your girlfriend. Like, it's like, no, she's off limits. Like, <laughs> since when? Like, what <laughs> makes her off limits? Exactly. So when you try to step out of it, then you start seeing the sense, like, listen, it didn't make sense for you and him to be beefing about you live there, he lives here, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it, like, brings you back into reality because a lot of us are desensitized and we get programmed into thinking a certain way. And I was, too, because selling drugs, like, we used to sell drugs to pregnant women. And guys, there were some guys who didn't do that. Mm -hmm. It was like, I'm not selling drugs to pregnant women. And then there was others of us who'd be like, well, they're going to get it from somebody. I might as well get that money. That wasn't right. That wasn't right. There may be, there, there, there's possible, there are some kids, uh, adults, because this was so many years ago, there are some adults that are going around and they have issues mm -hmm. because their mother was smoking crack that I sold. I may not have been the only one that right. sold it, but I contributed to that. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it like that, you say, well, listen, if my wife, my girlfriend, my daughter, my cousin, or whatever is using drugs and someone sells it to them, I'm not going to like that. If I say convicted at birth to you, what would you get out of that? I would interpret that as being stigmatized as something bad from the onset. So as like how they say us, like us as a race, we're basically born behind the eight ball and we're destined for failure or for jail, prison. That's a great answer. And convicted at birth is why I wore my shirt today because you were coming on my show today. And seriously, uh, our upbringing, our structural upbringing, we were convicted at birth, man. Not having a mother, having a father that was miles away and sometimes took care of you, being raised by your grandmother, being stigmatized, that in itself is convicted at birth. However, as you just, as you just stated, we are uh, also taught that being convicted at birth is to fail. We'll be failures. However, if you see this baby is holding the key, right? And we all have that key within us to utilize, to unleash these bounds, these, these chains that has a lot, whether it's psych psychology, psychologically, whether it's physically. And you are an example of this. You were convicted at birth. However, look at you are using your key. You see? And it's imperative that uh, people understand that, that you have the key. We convicted. Right? We convicted, but we don't have to give up. We can use that key. We can use that key and be successful. We don't have to make people that say that we're going to be failures correct. And you are exemplifying that. And I want the lookers, I want the, I want the listeners, I want the watchers to understand that this is a man who's exemplifying what we can do. We don't have to be failures. We can succeed. And I commend you for that. Thank you. What I, I'm, I'm kind of stubborn. Mm -hmm. And that can be a good thing. Because when people told me I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that, 